So there's an election for A and P2. Um, kind of a, you know, we'll kind of do this in a couple parts. Uh, on chapter 18 in regards to blood. First, we'll just talk. Uh, we'll discuss some just basic concepts and some basic characteristics of blood, and then we'll get yeah, we'll get specific into the different types of blood cells, erythrocytes, leukocytes, and platelets, and we'll talk about the kind of just the importance of having those cells and maintaining them and how they're produced. And then we'll talk, last but not least, just a little bit about blood typing and the importance of that. Okay. So first, let's just start out with some basic characteristics of blood. All right. One of the major characters, I mean, so one of the big things when it comes to understanding uh, blood and even just the cardiovascular system in general is we would like to say that this is a closed system. When we say this is a closed system, what we mean is, is you only find, you know, the blood, the substance that's being circulated throughout the body within the blood vessels. It stays within the system, okay? And even though we do have a little bit of fluid exchange between blood and tissues for the purpose of unloading oxygen and nutrients to tissues and picking up waste products as blood is pumped by our cells and our tissues, all of that water that we unload into the tissues will eventually be reloaded back into the blood. Okay, so so basically this is the, all of this plays a big part in a fluid cycle, which we'll put together. I mean, throughout the next couple of chapters that we're talking about. Okay. So the circulatory system is a closed system. It's a system that's not supposed to leak, basically. Leak a lot, all right? And whatever is leaked out does return back into the bloodstream, all right? And if we do break a vessel and we make an opening in this closed system, then that's what we call bleeding. And if it's in really massive or high amounts, we would call that hemorrhaging, okay? So moral of the story, we want blood to stay within our blood vessels and our heart. We want to keep it contained, okay? And that's why we say it's a closed system, all right? Now, when it comes to talking about blood, first let's talk about the basic functions of blood. You know, probably the, the biggest function of blood would be transport, okay? We use blood to circulate um, substances all around our body. We use blood to circulate oxygen from our lungs to our healthy tissues. We use blood to circulate carbon dioxide, a, a, a gas that's a waste product, from away from our healthy tissues to our lungs so we can exhale it. Okay, so we're transporting gases around our bloodstream, okay, to the proper areas where we, you know, where we need them. Okay, we're also transporting nutrients. We're transporting substances like glucose, amino acids, fatty acids, minerals, okay, electrolytes. We're circulating these around the body. Okay, again, for the importance of delivering them to tissues, okay, because cells are little metabolic machines that constantly need more than just oxygen. They need, they need a lot of other fuel substrates, and blood is how we get them, you know, how we get those fuels, those substrates to the working cells of our tissues, okay? So your blood is not only transporting useful substances to your tissues, to your cells to uptake and utilize, your blood is also transporting waste products away from tissues to a couple areas of the body so we can eliminate them. There are three major areas of the body that we're circulating waste products to for the purpose of elimination, for the purpose of eliminating them from the body. Okay, one of them is the lungs. Okay, we just mentioned this. We circulate carbon dioxide to the lungs so we can exhale it and get rid of it. If we, if we start to lose our ability to do this, we're gonna lose our ability to properly regulate our pH and things are gonna go awry, especially your metabolism and your nervous system. Okay, we're transporting um, a lot of waste products to your kidneys. Okay, your kidneys constantly filter and clean, not clean, but they filter your blood. You know, they filter all the, not all, but most of the unwanted waste out of the bloodstream and they mix it with water and form urine and then we expel that urine from our body and the waste products are expelled out with it. Okay, I mean, granted, there's a lot more detail to the story than that, but we'll save that for the urinary system. All right, so we're transporting those waste to the kidneys, and we're also circulating these waste products to the liver. Okay, and some waste products and also a lot of nutrients as well. The liver, I mean, a lot of people like to say the liver detoxifies the body, um, you know, which in a sense is true. I mean, the question is, is can you tell me what a toxin is? Even what, what does toxin even mean in medical terminology? Toxin means poison. So anything that's poison is potentially poisonous to the body. We, we, we could pump it there, and there are phagocytes that sit there and wait. 
to clean out the blood and you know clean out whatever especially we, whatever we absorb in our in our GI tract goes to our liver sorry wrong side goes to your liver and then we figure out what to do with it there okay also your spleen there's also your spleen is good at picking up infections if there's any if there's any pathogen in your blood your, your spleen is going to pick up on it really quickly okay so transport as one of the major functions of blood transport another one is immunity okay immunity your blood, I mean, contain, I mean, contains cells of your immune system, white blood cells to be specific, okay? And you know that your immune system protects you. Your immune system protects you from things that get you sick, which we would call pathogens. Or maybe there are things that we're a little sensitive to, like allergens, that we that, that stimulate an immune response, okay? Um, but that's, you know, again, this is really important. I wouldn't necessarily lump, lump these together and say, you know, one's more important than the other because without your immune system, you won't live, okay, because you'll get all these weird infections and you won't survive as these organisms are killing you from the inside out. So your immune system is extremely important, okay. Making sure we're getting fuels to our cells and getting waste products away is equally as important because that's how they stay alive, okay. Both of these help keep us alive. And regulation also helps keep us alive. Now, blood plays a role in regulation, it kind of helps, you know, we use, you know, blood plays a role in, like I said, this fluid cycle, you know, making sure that, you know, we have a balanced amount of fluids between our blood and our tissue spaces. We don't want there to be an unequal distribution of water between our blood and our tissues as we're undergoing this fluid cycle, which we'll talk about more in depth later on, okay? And also plays a role in regulating pH because there are chemical buffers that are found within your blood that can help us neutralize our pH if we have if we're if we're going too extreme whether we're getting too basic or too um, too acidic okay so these are the major functions of blood right a transport immunity and a regulation okay now when we talk about blood we want to kind of talk about the general composition of blood the makeup of blood okay now blood is you know, 55, we can, you know, let's just say for the sake of discussion, blood is 55% plasma. What we're seeing here is basically that blood is 55% water. Okay. Now it's not just pure water. Okay. You know, your pla you know, within your plasma, there are proteins, there are electrolytes, there are gases dissolved in there. So it's not just pure water. It's water with a bunch of solutes in it. Okay. But this makes up the major composition of blood, plasma, the watery portion of your blood. Okay. And then the remaining 45% is what we would call the formed elements of blood. When we say formed elements, think of the cells. Okay. The cells of blood. Okay. The cellular makeup of blood. And there are three major types of cells that are found within the bloodstream. Okay. Erythrocytes, leukocytes, and platelets. Erythrocytes, leukocytes, and platelets. Ure remember, ureth stands for red, and site is cell. So these are your red blood cells. Okay, these are your red blood cells. Leukocytes are your leuco. Remember, means white, and then site is cell. Leukocytes are your white blood cells, and then platelets. In a true sense, platelets are not really cells. They're actually fragments of cells that are found in your bone marrow called megakaryocytes. We'll talk about that later on in a little more detail. But when you put all three of these, when you look, put all these three of these together, we can say this is the cellular makeup of blood, and this is what we call the four elements of blood. And these are the two major parts of the bloodstream: plasma and the four elements. Okay, plasma and the four elements. All right. So now, let's kind of talk about volume, how much blood a person typically has, all right? You know, we can say that, you know, the average human has about four to six liters of blood within their body, four to six liters of blood, okay? Let's just for the sake, for the sake of discussion in class, the average human has five liters of blood, okay? The average human has five liters of blood, all right? Now, my question to you is, is that, does that number ever change? Do people's blood volumes go up or down? The answer is yes. Okay. Because remember, 55% of your blood is water. Okay. When you, when, you know, when you make sweat, when you need to cool yourself, that's where we get the 
water to create sweat from. We filter, we filter the plasma out of your blood and the sweat glands turn it into sweat and then we excrete it on our skin. That'll drop your blood volume. Okay? But you can correct that by drinking more water, rehydrating. Like for example, if you go run a race and you lose some weight, you lose some body weight, okay, just because of sweating, you can regain that body weight back just by rehydrating again. Okay? You know, we make adaptations to exercise by increasing our blood volume. Okay? You know, and, and the percentage of cells in our blood. All right, now let me ask you this. What do you think is the biggest variable that plays into how much blood a person has? What's the biggest factor that will determine how much blood a, a human has? Not exercise. Not your sedentary or not. It's not what you eat. But it really is, the biggest factor is body size. Okay. I mean, Shaquille O'Neal is going to have more blood in his body than me. I'm 6'1 on a good day. He, I, I got to look up at him easily. Okay. He's a larger organism, has a larger body mass, larger, just more tissues. He needs more blood. Okay. So he's going to have a higher blood volume than myself. Okay. Just because he is a much larger individual than me and at the same time, I think of a basketball player. Okay? So, we'll just say for the sake of discussion that humans have, on average, five liters of blood. Okay? Now, when we want to take a look at the composition of blood, we want to take a look at basically how much, you know, if you want to say, okay, well, a person has five liters of blood, how can you kind of tell if, you know, there's, you know, the difference between the plasma and the water, or the, I'm sorry, the plasma and the formed elements, how much of each there is, this is where a centrifuge would come in. You would draw a little bit of blood, and then what you would do is you put it in a centrifuge and you spin it. And then you let that you let that blood spin for a little while, and then what you would do is, is you would take a test tube, or you know you pull the test tube out of there, and then what you would do is you would look at how the blood separates. Okay, so well, let me ask you this. Where would you find the four elements after you spun this tube really fast? Yeah. I think they'd be in the bottom or the top. Which one's heavier than, which one's heavier, water or the cells? The cells are. So the four elements, okay, would kind of settle to the bottom. And then the plasma, the watery portion, would be on top. And this is fairly true. I mean, whenever you take blood out and spin it, this is what you should see. 55% plasma, 45% form elements. Okay. So that's kind of, uh, again, that's how we do, that's kind of how we determine this. All right. And since cells are heavier than plasma, it's gonna, they're going to settle to the bottom. Now, you got to remember when you're looking at plasma after you pull it out and then you see the separation take place, you know, plasma is not just going to look like water. It's not going to be clear. It's going to have kind of a maybe a yellowish color to it because of all the solutes that are dissolved in it. Okay, which may you know which you know makes it a little more um, opaque and harder to see through. You know, unlike water. Okay, so that's basically blood composition within the human body. Okay, now what I want to do next is just kind of just start talking about the two different parts of blood. I want to start talking a little bit about um, plasma and the urethrocytes. Okay. Okay, we'll work, we'll work around that. Okay, so let's talk about plasma a little bit, the watery portion of blood. So first, I mean, you know that plasma is basically just water. So let's just talk about what's mixed in with the water. All right. So first, we'll talk about plasma proteins. Plasma proteins. Okay. Probably the most abundant class of plasma proteins is going to be albumin. Albumin. Okay, this is the most abundant type of plasma protein you're going to see. Okay, um, albumin is synthesized in the liver. 
all right, and it's a protein. So in order to make a protein, you have to consume protein. You have to get the amino acids out of your diet so you can put this together. So eating things like meat, um, if you're a vegetarian, the right combinations of vegetables is necessary. Okay. Um, okay. Um, but like I said, albumin is made in the liver. And probably we can say the major functions of albumin would be osmolarity. Okay, osmolarity. What we mean is, is how water is going to be distributed within the blood. Okay, is it going to move out of the blood? Is it going to stay in the blood? Okay, this plays a very large role in the fluid exchange, like I mentioned earlier, when we're trying to deliver nutrients into tissues and reabsorb it back into the bloodstream. Albumin plays a big role in sucking that water back into the blood. We're talking about capillary um, dynamics, but like I said, that's a topic we'll save for later on. Okay. Well, let's kind of hit on this a little bit. So let's say you don't have enough albumin in your blood. Okay, you don't have enough albumin. You could get that from just not eating enough protein. Okay, you get that from liver damage. Okay, so you don't have enough um, albumin in your system. What's going to happen then is you're going to have a harder time reabsorbing water back into your bloodstream, and basically your blood volume is going to start to drop. But the problem is, is you're going to have a, you're going to have edema taking place because you're going to have water building up in tissues, and this is especially common in the abdomen, okay? Like you see in the condition called Quashira cord. Okay? You know, like if you, when you see pictures of um, folks from parts of the world that don't have um, very good access to nutrients, all right, or nourishment. You know, so you see pictures of these individuals with these kind of, with these very skinny frames and these very big distended abdomens and very skinny arms and skinny legs, okay? Their abdomen is so big and distended because all that water is pouring out of their bloodstream and building up in their abdomen. Okay? And then their limbs and their, I mean, everything else is going to be really skinny because their muscle tissue is being, they're basically eating themselves. Okay? Their muscles, since they're not consuming enough protein, they're trying to get the amino acids from somewhere else. And they're getting, I mean, the best source to get it from is your muscle tissue, your skeleton, okay? Um, I mean, when you eat meat, that's what you eat. You eat muscle tissue. You eat skeletal muscle. That's where we get it from as well. If we if we're in a if we're in a starvation situation like that, okay. So then all that water is going to build up in the abdomen, and that's not a that's not a healthy situation to be in. And we'll talk about the consequences of edema much later on. But edema is not a good thing. And this is a reversible condition. You just have to start infusing protein into the person's diet. Okay. So that's albumin. Okay. Um, another very common plasma protein that you're going to find that's made in the liver is fibrinogen. Okay, we'll talk about this more in depth later on, but fibrinogen, we use this to form clots. Okay, we use this to form blood clots. This, this, this is part of a very complex pathway in forming an actual blood clot. Um, to prevent us from losing blood. Now, blood clots are necessary. Blood clots are important. Okay, I mean, people give blood clots a bad reputation because of the whole heart attack and stroke thing. Okay, but, you know, but if people didn't have occluded clogged arteries with a bunch of plaque and atheromas, clots wouldn't be as big of a problem. Okay, so we form, so we use this to form a clot to control bleeding. And again, these are formed in the liver as well. All right. And then the other major class of, of plasma protein, okay, are globulins. Or your immunoglobulins to be more specific. Okay. Globulins, basically what these are, is they are antibodies. Globulins are antibodies. Okay. We use antibodies for the purposes of defending ourselves. Antibodies are markers that can stick to foreign antigens. And, you know, we use those markers to recognize those foreign cells so we can uh, have an immune response and eliminate the foreign antigen. Okay, we're going to come back to this in a little while when we talk about blood typing. All right. Now, when it comes to globulins, though, these are not made in the liver. These are made by cells called plasma cells. Okay. These are synthesized by cells called plasma cells. Okay, plasma cells we'll go into more in depth again when we talk about the immune response. But these are cells, um, they're, they're, they're basically a specialized type of B cell that when turned on, that's all they do is they just break out 
very, very high numbers of antibodies to protect us from anything that's infected, that's invading us. Infected. Okay. So these are the three major types of proteins you'll find within the plasma. Okay, albumin, which is the most abundant and common type, which plays a role in osmolarity. Fibrinogen, um, we use this to form blood clots. And again, these two are both made in the liver. And then we've got globulins, i.e. antibodies, that help, the, that, help the, that help to defend us against foreign antigens, foreign invaders. Okay, and then also within the plasma, there's other stuff. Okay, like amino acids, okay, glucose, electrolytes, okay, other minerals, okay, fats, okay, I mean, yeah, salt gases, there's a lot, you know, waste products, okay, there's a lot of other small solutes that are found within our, um, Within our plasma, again, that we circulate around the body based on our, you know, I mean, for the purpose of feeding ourselves, keeping us alive. You know, we we circuit, you know, we use the amino acids to build proteins. The glucose is a fuel source for all cells, especially neurons. Electrolytes play a role in osmolarity. Um, you know, again, these minerals we deliver for various purposes. Um, fats, again, energy purposes, circulating these fats around. The gases, it depends on what type of gas we're talking about, but we circulate them to either eliminate or to use, and then waste. Okay, you know, waste that we circulate to our proper organs so we can eliminate from the body. Okay, so those are just the major kind of general characteristics of blood that I wanted to mention. Oh, I, I, I'm sorry, I forgot. There's a couple other characteristics I want to mention. All right, I want to talk next about something called viscosity. I'll talk about something called viscosity. Okay, viscosity, when people, I mean, I remember for a long time, and I still think about this when I hear this word, people tend to think of viscosity as thickness. Okay, how thick a fluid is, how thick a, a liquid substance is. Okay, so let me ask you this, which would be more viscous, water or blood? Let's just say water out of your sink, tap water or blood. Think about it. What do you think is more stuff? Which one has more stuff in it? The blood or the tap water? Tap water, you know, has some minerals in it, maybe some chlorine, some small solutes. Blood has cells and proteins and lots of other stuff that we just saw. So therefore, the more stuff we have mixed in that blood and the bigger the stuff we have mixed in that blood, the thicker it's going to be. So blood is about five times more viscous than water. It's more thick than water. Okay, corn syrup is more viscous than water. It's more thick. It has a lot of sugar and carbohydrates dissolved in it, which makes it more thick. Okay. By definition, viscosity is resistance to flow. Resistance to flow. Okay. Now, the more thick, the more thick your blood is, the more resistance to flow we're going to have. Okay. Meaning the harder it's going to be to pump the blood. Okay, the hard, it's going to be more difficult the more thick our blood gets. Okay. For example, dehydration. Okay. As we, um, as we sweat a lot and we lose water, all we're going to have left is, well, not all we're going to have left, but we're going to have a lower level of plasma and a higher level of formed elements. You know that cells are bigger and thicker than water, so it's going to be a lot harder for our heart to circulate that, that thick, sticky sludge, you know, that dehydrated blood around the body. Okay? So viscosity. Now the biggest factor, though, that plays into viscosity is not your plasma levels. It's something, that's, it's something that's, that we call the hematocrit. Okay? Hematocrit basically is the percentage of, I'm going to abbreviate this, RBC, is the percentage of your blood that is red blood cells. Okay? Red blood cells are by far the most abundant type of cell you're going to find in the blood. By far the most abundant type. Okay. So when it comes to uh, when it comes to males, a male somatocrit should be around 47 percent, you know, give or take five percent. Okay, around 47 percent, give or take five percent. Okay. So what we're saying here is that. 45% of a male's blood 
the composition of it should just be red blood cells. Okay. When it comes to female, females we can say are about 42%. Give or take again, 5%. Okay, 42%. So there's a difference. Men and men and women do have different volumes and different compositions to their blood. Okay, and so the question is, is why do men have a higher hematocrit compared to women? Okay, biggest reason is hormonal differences. All right, hormonal differences. All right, those hormonal differences cause two events. One, women menstruate on a monthly basis; they lose blood on a regular basis, so that'll that'll lower their hematocrit. Okay, the other one, the hormonal differences is testosterone. Okay, testosterone plays a bigger role in promoting red blood cell production than estrogen. So men are going to have a slightly higher percentage than women when it comes to red blood cells. Okay. So viscosity. Now, now the reason why I bring this up is in regards to blood pressure, which is abbreviated BP. Okay. What do you think is going to happen to your blood pressure if your blood becomes more viscous, if it becomes more thick? You think it's going to go up or down? You think if your blood's more thick, there will be more resistance or less resistance? If you said your blood pressure will go up, you were correct. Okay, your blood pressure will rise the more viscous your blood gets, okay? Because if your heart is going to have to work harder to pump that thick sludgy fluid around your, you know, all around your body through your vessels. Because remember, blood is a kind of, by nature, is a connective tissue. Okay? It's a connective tissue. Again, remember, connective tissues, you know, one of the big characteristics about them when you look at their extracellular matrix, gels and fibers, proteins mixed in water. Okay, when you mix enough proteins in water, you'll form gels. And those gels are really, really sticky substances. Okay, blood is a sticky substance. The more thick it gets, the harder it's going to be to circulate, and therefore your blood pressure will go up. Okay, your blood pressure will go up. So it's important that we maintain a normal hematocrit and that we stay properly hydrated so we can lessen the workload on our heart and also, uh, over many years and a long period of time, maintain the structural integrity of our blood vessels, especially our arteries. Because unchecked, high blood pressure can be damaging in the long run. Okay? So viscosity is an important characteristic to talk about and understand. And the other one I want to mention is briefly with osmolarity. Okay, osmolarity. Okay, osmolarity. Remember, we're talking about the amount of osmotically active particles within the blood. Okay. So basically, when we're talking about blood, so let's say... Um, when it comes to this, let's say there is, ooh, I don't know, let's say there is more blood pressure on this side of the vessel, and there is also, I don't know, let's just say there are 20 plasma proteins, okay? And let's say on this side of the vessel of the tissue, there are 30 plasma proteins, okay? So what's going to happen is... Since there are more of these plasma proteins, remember proteins in water kind of have a strong attraction to one another, water, you know, a pulling attraction to one another. What will happen is that will kind of suck the water out of the blood vessel into the tissue spaces. Okay? And then as blood will flow through this vessel, the blood volume will start to drop and the concentration of proteins will go get higher. So let's say there's still give or take. I mean, there, there. I mean, in, in retrospect, there really aren't any proteins in the plasma. I'm just giving this as an example. I'm mean, sorry, the tissue spaces. Okay. Well, let's say your protein concentration now went up to 45, and you know the tissue space, the proteins in the tissue spaces remain somewhat constant. Now the water would be sucked back into the bloodstream. So we push water. So we kind of push water out and deliver nutrients and oxygen to the tissues, and then we suck that water back in so we make sure our blood volume stays relatively healthy and constant. Okay. So, I mean, that's just a, you know, probably not the best example of osmolarity to come up with, but uh, that's what we mean by osmolarity. Okay. 
how how do the how do the solutes within the blood influence the movement of water? And remember, we're, when we're talking about osmolarity, we're talking about again the movement of water. So just because there's more solutes out here, remember, think of this in a reciprocal fashion. The more solutes there are, the less available water molecules, less free water molecules there are. There was a higher concentration of water in here and a lower concentration out here, and vice versa on the other end. Okay, so that's osmolarity. And again, this is important because we want to make sure we have a good balance between the osmolarity in our tissues and our blood, because if we don't, then that's when edema occurs, and that's when our then that's when things really go up with us. Okay, so that's kind of what I want to talk about with the basic characteristics of blood. Next, let's talk about urethrocytes.